And I would like to invite now Dr. Murali Doiswani to join um, this discussion. Hello. Hi, Murali. It's a real pleasure to be together again on a panel. We have uh, some experience when we were together in the WEF. Um, I mean, it's almost um, uh, not necessary to introduce you, but uh, I would say a few words about your extraordinary work. So you have a co-chair, you really have two, two hats. One is a co-chair of the Global Future Council on Mental Health at the World Economic Forum. The second, the professor of psychiatry and medicine at the Duke University. And at the same time, you're advising governments, businesses, advocacy groups, such as NIH, FDA, WHO, and the WEF, where it's basically almost no committee where your name doesn't show up. <laughs> um, the work, your work has a strong scientific component, and this is really how can we diagnose better? I mean, I was reading some of your papers recently, which is really absolutely to a point we need, we need to diagnose early. But then you also contributed to leading products in the cognitive and psychiatric uh, conditions, and you are even a book author. So, I mean, it's very wide <laughs> what you're doing. So that's why we are extremely honored that you could join us today and discuss a bit more. And we are, I think, all interested in the audience what is actually the biological, what is the science behind trauma on our brain and mental health? So if I may uh, start with um, one of the important question, how do you see that COVID-19 has actually changed the, the mental health uh, aspect? Is the focus today really uh, shifted? How have in particular young people, women, suffered um, from this pandemic? Well, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me to this wonderful forum and thank you for this very gracious introduction. It's such an honor to be amongst so many distinguished uh, people in the audience. And I love the slogan, Be Brain Powerful, because uh, this is May is National Mental Health Month, at least in the US, and that's a wonderful, wonderful slogan. So I think let's move back before the COVID-19 pandemic Two and a half years ago, mental health was already a major worldwide crisis. Uh, we knew that it was a leading cause of disability. We knew that suicide was the second leading cause of death amongst young people. But still, we as a society did not do anything about it. Uh, we were grossly underinvested. There was a 70 to 80% shortage of therapists and clinicians and stigma continues to be a huge problem. So we always thought about mental health as that other person's problem, not our problem. And what COVID has done was horrific. Of course, millions of people died, uh, several hundred million people contracted COVID, the pandemic mitigation measures really brought home the importance of our own mental health. And for the first time, we started seeing the rise in anxiety, depression amongst our friends, family members, the bereavement that many of us suffered when we lost loved ones, and then especially the young, uh, as you mentioned, the young people, uh, the CDC did a poll uh, a few months ago that found something like 25% of young adults were uh, reporting suicidal ideation. So we don't know how this is going to progress in coming years, whether there will be a substantially sharp increase in suicides. But the bottom line, the one silver lining, if I may say so, is I think the whole world has realized the importance of fixing a suboptimal mental health system. So now it's a chance for us as a society to come together to put structures and systems in place that outlast the pandemic. The good news is many, many innovative thinkers have come forward to help. For example, we see telemedicine, the rise of uh, community-based mental health services, digital health solutions, a number of these, I think are promising approaches, but we need to do more. And I think this is that we have a once in a lifetime opportunity to fix it. Thank you. Um, my next question goes really to the science, and I couldn't resist to ask you this question because when I read this Nature paper, which came out a few weeks ago, um, I have to admit I was a sort of shocked. Um, basically, this paper shows that there is a, a real impact on the biology, the structure of the brain um, by COVID-19, and um, and. It, 
we don't know exactly if this is just a temporary thing or a, a longer thing. So what is your view? Are we really here looking at um, uh, something which is observed, uh, but when it goes away, or do we have to expect uh, even a higher rate of Alzheimer coming from this COVID-19? That's a wonderful question. I would say in many ways, that's the billion dollar question we don't have all the answers to. But mm -hmm. let me backtrack a bit. The paper that you're referring to in the mm -hmm. prestigious journal Nature was a study of about 700 or so individuals enrolled in something called the UK Biobank. These people were having annual or biannual brain MRI scans. And it so happened that about half of these individuals contracted COVID. Now, these were not people that got very severe COVID and were hospitalized and had encephalitis, et cetera. These were people for the most part had very mild COVID. And the researchers were asking a very interesting question. They said, yeah, we know severe COVID can damage the brain, can cause confusion, delirium, but what about very mild cases of COVID? Can it change the structure of the brain? And they found that, yes, they found there was shrinkage of the brain in several key regions. And they also found that people who had mild COVID experienced sharper cognitive decline over time. Now, of course, the study is not fully definitive. We don't know all of the confounding factors. But I think it's supported by a range of other evidence. For example, we know viruses get into the brain and can cause cognitive impairment and dementia. Everybody has heard of syphilis-related dementia. Everybody is now knows that HIV, the virus uh, that's related to AIDS, can cause dementia. So we, there's also theories that certain microbes and viruses may be linked to Alzheimer's disease. We know that 30% of people who survive COVID hospitalization experience what is called as long COVID neurological symptoms, including loss of smell, fatigue, aches and pains, neuropathy, and cognitive decline. We know there is a bi-directional relationship between COVID and cognitive impairment and dementia. We know people with dementia had a higher rate of contracting COVID and dying from COVID. We also know that amongst those who recovered from COVID, there is a higher incidence of both mild cognitive impairment and dementia. The real question is, is this a new entity that we are going to call as COVID dementia? Or is this really what we are calling as Alzheimer's that is triggered by a viral infection in the brain? I think that remains to be seen, but it's a very, very important area for research. Yeah, you can imagine it goes very close to my heart. Um, now moving from dementia and COVID to the Ukraine. Um, in my own environment, I saw so many families, young people, myself actually, to be really impacted by this war. So from your perspective as a scientist, again, do you see any biological clinical impacts of a trauma on the brain? And what can we do about it? Well, of course, uh, there is substantial impact of trauma on the brain, especially very severe, serious types of trauma. Um, so there's two questions. One is what are the immediate impacts? Second is what are the lasting impacts? And an even more interesting question is what are the intergenerational impacts? In other words, are there changes at the genetic and molecular level that can be passed on to future generations? So I think the immediate impacts are very obvious to everyone, right? Very profound um, you know, loss of identity, anxiety, stress, uh, insomnia, uh, nightmares, um, you know, uh, depression, anxiety, potentially leading to PTSD. So those are clear sort of acute consequences, but fortunately many of them uh, can recover from it if they are provided the appropriate psychosocial support, support and um, are able to sort of uh, uh, talk through their trauma with, um, you know, in a supportive environment. So that's why psychosocial and mental support is so crucial, uh, what we call a psychological first aid uh, in the immediate phase. Now, the longer term sequelae are a little harder to predict because it depends on what the environment that they then get. Uh, if they have a very supportive environment, a nurturing environment, you can prevent or mitigate both the long term consequences and the future consequences. That's why it's so important for us as a society to come together to make sure that um, uh, we can help all of those who are in distress and trauma. Thank you. My last question, um, and just maybe a short response. Um, parents with children showing um, alarming signs of trauma, what do you think are these signs? And when do you ask for professional help? 
support, how can we support mothers, families in this question? Yeah, I think, um, you know, children um, are going to be a founded, uh, are going to be affected very profoundly. Uh, so children are very, very vulnerable to um, any signs of loss of security uh, in their parents. So uh, chronic stress can affect children differently depending on the age. For example, older kids like adolescents and teens might rebel, sleep more, become withdrawn, uh, use drugs. Whereas younger kids who are even more sensitive to their parents' fears, you know, when security is breached, um, you know, you can see signs like crying, clinging, bedwetting, nightmares. You know, every time a siren goes off, you know, you may see, uh, you know, the child sort of reacting uh, uh, in a way that's uh, uh, concerning. So I think, I think the key is to, um, uh, you know, provide a supportive environment, a routine, um, you know, um, really uh, get them involved in hobbies, nature, uh, and, and, and sort of reassure them. Uh, but also, I think, provide mental health evaluation if these symptoms get severe and they persist for several weeks.